and that is all about what is new in diabetic retinopathy. Let's focus on screening and the grading. To uh, present this topic, we have an eminent surgeon with us, Dr. Rupa Biswas. He is the director of Natural Lab. And to chair the session, we have a uh, very promising Dr. Richa Kawal Kumar. Sir and ma'am, please come with us. so this was our exactly the you know the uh, the, uh, the uh, outlook about ophthalmology Richa, would you agree with me i completely yeah. agree yeah so so with this i mean whenever you have a diabetic retinopathy but ultimately when you come to the diabetes part the eye which is actually guiding the diabetic diabetologist for the next plan of management. But when you talk about diabetic retinopathy, the screening is one of the most important and grading system with that screening is important. But why? Why it is needed? Because you want to prevent the vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. That is the most important part of it. If you have a vision threatening diabetic retinopathy, which will cause the you know severe impairment of vision and you want to prevent that so that uh, uh, the majority of your patient does not go blind. And this is a, one of the important part of preventable blindness in India, especially when India is going to be the diabetic capital in the recent future. This is my financial disclosure. Now, if you, if you think of the current staging system and the changes what is happening here, so to see the current staging system, this is already the previous, the early host classification, and then after that, the modified early host classification, how the things are, have been changing, but the basic concept has not changed. What is there? It is either you have a no or mild to moderate non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Earlier it was background, then pre proliferative, and the proliferative diabetic retinopathy was there. But in this stage, it is actually the, these are the three initial part, which, you know, and these are the part which actually will not. Uh, you know, under follow up. But these are the part which actually needs you for the treatment and then follow up. So this is one of the most important part of it. So this is the green part which is which you need to just follow up and this is the red zone which needs intervention for that. And here is the control of risk factor for the progression of and then you know control of the diabetic uh, control to rule out the macular edema development. When it's, once the macular edema develops, then you need to treat it. And for mild, it is it is near about six months forward. So why I'm talking about this when I'm talking about the new oil screening system? So if you don't go for the basic of it, then it is difficult to understand the how we are proceeding about it. So in this stage of a referable diabetic retinopathy, these are the one, ones you have a severe diabetic retinopathy or in the proliferative stage or you have in the diabetic macroedema. So these are the treatable condition which has to be treated by a retinologist. So this is the condition which is referable condition or these are the condition to be referred. Now the treatment of DME again earlier was clinically significant macroedema. That is I think you are also uh, quite accustomed with this term. But once the system changes, then we have we thought that clinically significant macular edema as a term, where even if you the central involvement is not there or the vision is not dropped, still we treat them. So we have divided into them whether it's a central involving macular edema and non-central involving macular edema. And the treatment protocol varies according to the whether it is a central or non-central involving. So the major treatment for central involving is anti-VEGF with or without laser, whereas non-central involving majority of the treatment is a focal laser treatment. So I'm not going into those details about it, 
when you have a kind of a, this kind of a vitreoretinal traction, whatever injection laser you give, it is not going to uh, serve the purpose, so you have to do the surgery and remove those traction. So let's see here, what are the, with this background, what are the changes is happening over this last decade. So the changes in the understanding of the disease, the pathogenesis of the disease, this is the most important part of it. Initially, we all thought it's the vascular changes which is happening in the diabetic retinopathy, and then slowly we realized with that vascular changes, even before the vascular changes occurring, the neuronal changes which is occurring first. So probably, this is the basic understanding of the disease which has changed from our, to the vascular changes to the neuronal changes, and the development of these neuronal changes is actually the, the metabolic changes which is happening in our body is a reflection of that. So the inflammatory pathway here plays an important role. So overall metabolic disease, the diabetes is, is a metabolic disease which we are we, we accept this fact, isn't it? So if it is if it is a metabolic disease, so the inflammatory role has to come into it. So the inflammatory role is playing a role even before the changes of the you know obvious uh, uh, microvasculopathy changes which is occurring in the front us. So what is changes in the diagnosis? So diagnosis is in terms of screening, grading, diagnostic, multiple different modality of diagnostic treatment has come and we are so powerful in diagnostic the system and even I can tell you even the earliest before much earlier development of the vascular changes which is occurring in the eye we are able to detect whether this patient is developing or in the process of development of diabetic retinopathy or not by doing, you know, microperimetry test and uh, even the OCT changes is also occurring in different ways. But when it comes for the screening system, the initially was dilated fundus uh, and geofundus uh, examination was the initial changes from where, from where we have gone to a lot of non-dilating fundus camera, OCT, even even the non dilating system so we have a multiple gadgets and these are all you know hand carry possible so this is it, it is not that it has to be fixed on your uh, training it is in the multiple places you can replicate and the most important is that you know reproducibility is fantastic with this kind of instrument we are just talking about few a uh, few minutes back with the origin regarding one of this system only so these are these are all uh, uh, very very evident in our hand. So this is this is this is possible. Of any point of time, anywhere you tell, we can do this. The newer modality of you know multimodal imaging. You have a fundus. Not only the fundus imaging. The once you have the fundus imaging, you have proven diabetic retinopathy or diabetic maculopathy. Then what stage it is? That is the most important. And on that basis, you decide about what kind of a treatment you are going to do. And to decide on that, there are multiple modality of you know investigation is there in our hand. So once it comes from your hand to our hand, then it is it is much easier. But the picking up at that level, whether that patient should come to us at a particular time is more important. So that's how the role of screening is important. So need for now earlier we used to just follow up, but once this is a game changer in, in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy, or maybe the diabetic maculopathy or in, in the whole scenario. And believe me, I think you all know that cataract is probably the one of the most, you know, most commonly done surgical procedure in ophthalmology. Believe me, this is going to, in by another 10 years, this is going to cross the diabetic, uh, uh, this intravitreal injection is going to cross the, the incidence of uh, cataract surgery. It will go much more than this because this is actually the game changer in diabetic, not only the diabetic retinopathy, the whole retinal treatment part has completely changed. And with this, nowadays, the more and more of the intravitreal injection we are being introduced, the severity of the diabetic retinopathy has gone down significantly. Now, I'm not going into the detail of that. What comes from further your role of this? This is the treatment and screening. Both the part is very, very important by balancing the, the diabetic retinopathy management. So when, once it comes, let me focus on this treatment part. We are just concentrating only the eye. The majority of the treatment is under your care. And most of these are overall metabolic control, the glycemic control, treat control of blood pressure, dyslipidemia, other coexisting diseases like nephropathy, neuropathy, uh, everything, cardio, cardiopathy, everything is under your control. And we are always dependent on you for any point of time for the treatment. 
So the diabetic retinopathy, uh, even for the diabetic retinopathy management, when the treatment of fluorescent angiography is needed, the renal status to assess, treatment for anti vagum injection, fitness for anti vagum injection, good glycemic control, all every aspect, these are these are the part which we are thoroughly integrated with you. So the treatment is actually is a hand-on-hand -hand treatment. So the shake hand technique is very, very important, otherwise it is very difficult for us also to go ahead for a treatment per se for the for the eye. Now come to the screening part. Screening cannot be done by the ophthalmologist only because of this amount of the big, you know, uh, uh, 400 million uh, kind of uh, situation which is we need to we need to handle. This is not possible by only ophthalmologist. So the options for screening are dilated, uh, you know, uh, fundoscopy by direct ophthalmoscope or by the indirect ophthalmoscope. So it is a dilated, dilated the tropicamide and avoid phenylephrine. I will, I will not go into detail of it. So even with this, the, the model for this, actually either a physician-led model or an ophthalmologist-led model. It can happen how, how it is. So physician-led model, dilated direct ophthalmoscope and for all diabetic patients and uh, or maybe a non-mediatic fundus photography which will document the condition and then accordingly grading system. For ophthalmologists, it is indirect ophthalmoscopy is uh, uh, in a poor diabetic patient in diabetic clinic and dilate and see, or a teleophthalmology based. But whatever you do for this in this system of by the ophthalmologist or by the physician, ultimately the grading system which is more important after the screening, whether this patient is have diabetic retinopathy or not. Not only even sometimes you know the drusen or the subretinal yellowish deposit can be mistaken by a by a heart exudate. So which is which is for that a trend of ophthalmologist or a trend technician which is very, very needed. Now the hybrid model comes here, the most important part of it, whether the fundus camera in the physician clinic and grading by an ophthalmologist. So this is the this is called the hybrid model. But this hybrid model again is slowly, slowly being replaced by AI, which is you all know that artificial intelligence is going to come up with this make a way and uh, how it is this is going to replace the ophthalmologist role is again a lot of question of debatable because we always kind of debate that even the artificial intelligence cannot replace true intelligence but yes even with this so what the, the, the sustainability of a system depends upon the whether it is how much is cost effectiveness so with that cost effectiveness ai is coming much more higher than a trained personnel to put into behind the system. So this is how the artificial intelligence is, is you know, winning over the trend personnel. Now artificial intelligence is FDA approval and then has already been being used in India or any other in the multiple part of the world. So this is just to show you a kind of a, uh, you know, artificial system which we do use and this is in collaboration with Shankar Netralaya and Google. Uh, Mr. Sundar Pichai has taken a special interest for development of this artificial intelligence and we are using it on a regular basis for this. So this is a, you know, you choose an image from here and this image you drag into this, uh, this system, sorry, and drag into here, it will start analyzing it and just wait for a few seconds, it will give you this result like this. So once you have this artificial intelligence system, so you have just what you need is needed, you just need to take a photograph and put into this, they will tell you whether you have diabetic retinopathy or not. But this is, this is the part of whether for the screening part of it. Yes, this is an excellent tool, but the most important part lies behind it, whether to treat it or not. Now, when should we not use artificial intelligence? When the patient is a known retinopathy, you don't need to do it. Prior retinopathy patient is already on retinopathy treatment or the symptoms of vision impairment is due to some, something else like you have a cataract when the, you know, the, the photography is not properly, I have six more minutes, okay. So photography is not proper. So these are the conditions we'll not use. Now, to plan and manage and evaluation of the diabetic retinopathy system, diabetic retinopathy screening system is most important because once you have developed a system, whether that system is a foolproof or not, that is most important because if you are following a technique which is a faulty technique and that will give you a false result, it does not make any sense, isn't it? So for that, the salient features for the planning of a system, you need better to collaborate with an ophthalmologist who, uh, who can treat diabetic retinopathy. 
number one. Number two is, uh, you know, uh, the minimum resolution. These are the criteria what I have given it here. You need a train, you need to train the person and select. If you have a person who is taking the photograph, that has to be taken properly. Because if, you're, if the technique of photography is also not correct, then AI will not give you the picture. AI will not give you the uh, ultimate result. So, and obviously in collaboration with a reference system or a recall system. So whom to screen is for the first visit to you. Whoever is coming for a type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, maybe you have a five years time span in your hand. And further evaluation based on that, depending upon the, how the diabetic retinopathy status, on that basis the follow up will be there. And high risk management, those who are having the longer duration of diabetes and with other evidence of microangiopathy. Suppose the patient has already developed a uh, kidney problem and patient is still not having any diabetic retinopathy. So we need to have a little more close follow up for those patients because they are the high risk category of group. Now, which patient to refer? I have already earlier mentioned, you don't need to yeah, refer a patient where have no diabetic retinopathy or a mild or moderate diabetic retinopathy without diabetic macroedema. So mild, uh, till the moderate diabetic retinopathy without macroedema, you don't need to refer. Patient, more severe diabetic retinopathy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macroedema. These are the three conditions and where the ungrateful images are there. You are not sure about what is the cause of vision loss. So those are the conditions where it can be referred. The evaluation of diabetic retinopathy screening system, which I was talking about. See, the screening program should have of at least of 80% sensitivity and 95% specificity. Uh, less than 5% technical failure can be accepted. So 95% specificity, which is available for almost all the kind of you know AI system, established AI system is having like this kind of criteria. Obviously, trained personnel will have almost near about 98 to 99% sensitivity. A uh, uh, small subset, but whether this system is having this criteria or not, to have this follow up, you have to have a 10% of the normal images. Sorry, 10% of the normal images, and those who are already having a diabetic retinopathy to establish patient, you need to pull them and uh, you know, screen by a retinologist. It's, a, it's a just a, you know, uh, and then see how your AI system is working. So by this way, you can just, you know, uh, titrate this, uh, your uh, management system. So this is again a physician and ophthalmologist. It's a shake hand technique by which the best care of diabetic retinopathy can be given. And, you know, there are some myths which is, uh, you know, prevailing among us. The myth number one, I do not dilate with direct ophthalmoscope, I, do, I don't dilate because the, the patient may land up of having, you know, angle closure glaucoma, then I am in trouble. I, I, the patient may sue you. But see the fact, the general population of who is having a closed angle and who can develop like dilatation induced uh, uh, angle closure glaucoma, the risk is 1 in 20,000. I'm a little bit on the China population, but I'm not going into it, which is as good as like a, if you travel by uh, air and you can meet an accident. So this is this is as simple as that. So don't don't follow this way. So dilate is just a tropical mind which causes a mid dilatation, it does not go to the central benefit part of it. And myth number two, anything red, yellow, and white, you need to refer. No. The criteria what we have given is if it is a severe form of diabetic retinopathy, then only you can. Severe means in all quadrants you have hemorrhages or heart exuded or edema. So if you see redness in all quadrants of the eye, then it is severe form. If it is only in one quadrant, it is mild. If it is more than one quadrant, but not in all four quadrants, it is moderate. This is as simple as that. So up to moderate, you don't need to refer. If you see hemorrhages in all the quadrants, that is onwards are the proliferative changes, that is that you can refer. So this is just an example to show you how those are the cases where you should refer it. Or like this kind of when you have a hemorrhages <laughs> or multiple tractional retinopathy. Mr. Mathieu, once you lose vision, hardly there is an improvement. No. This was there. And with this, I would like to conclude that yes, 40% of patients, if you treat them properly, they have more than three-line improvement of vision. Three-line means? In the ETDR star chart, there is a three line improvement of vision. So, there is 15 letter gain, which is significant. Right? So, for example, if the patient is here at that point of time, one, two, three, so they improve it like this. Sorry, I have put it in a different way. Patient is here, they improve it on this side. 
so which is a significant improvement. 40 percent, 40 to 50 percent patients can get rid, and 80 to 90 percent patients you can stop losing vision, which is the, uh, what I have started with the talk. That the purpose of doing this screening and grading system is to prevent vision threatening diabetic retinopathy (VTDR), which is you know in all kind of you know all India uh, society or all India guidelines or even the American guidelines wherever you go, the VTDR, which is the term which is keep on coming in every time. So uh, even after vitrectomy success rate is also 80 to 90 percent for the anatomical success restoration, and I acknowledge the contribution of uh, my colleague. Dr. Rajiv, he is my colleague at Shankaranjali Chennai, and Dr. Tahidu is our VR fellow. And thank you all. I'm sorry for keeping you waiting for this uh, before lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this extensive talk. It was really very interesting. One thing I would uh, definitely yeah. like to add that uh, it is known that 16.9 percent of the diabetic patients they have diabetic retinopathy. And out of them, around 98% are such patients which are uh, recovered, recover, uh, recover, uh, recoverable. So it is very important to act in coordination, the physicians, the diabetologists, the nephrologists, along with ophthalmologists, so, can we get, so, so that we can avoid those uh, avoidable blindness. And especially that uh, uh, tele uh, teleophthalmological part, that was really very interesting and that is very important because all patients, they cannot make up to the tertiary level care. Like I get a lot of patients in Narayana also uh, regarding diabetic retinopathy, but there are several patients who come from peripheries. So if we can start with teleophthalmology things, uh, that will be beneficial definitely. That's what, that's what exactly I was talking about, teleophthalmology and artificial intelligence. Teleophthalmology was there since last 20 years. I mean, teleophthalmology is a system where the, there is a difference between, should not mix up with teleophthalmology and artificial intelligence. Teleophthalmology is a system from where you take a photograph and send it to a base hospital, where your, so that the ophthalmologist did not go there. So the grading system is being done there. Whereas AI is a system which can be incorporated to anywhere in the world. And artificial system, you don't need to sit the, you know, the trained personnel behind the system. The artificial intelligence will give this system from there, and they can tell them whether you have the diabetic retinopathy or not from there itself, and you guide the patient accordingly. I think uh, IDXDR is FDA approved okay. for that. Yes. Sir. I want one comment. Nice presentation by Dr. Nikos We as clinicians are very much worried about diabetic retinopathy because of its uh, visual impairment, which may be very severe. Patient may become blind, and diabetes is one of the commonest causes. I think when a patient with diabetes, like you have also mentioned how when to refer, I think when a patient presents with uh, diabetes of some standing, one should go for a retinal examination, number one. Number two, when he has symptoms of peripheral neuropathy or some, let's say, micro uh, albuminuria in urine, he should at least be sent for uh, retinal examination because we know of diabetic tetra where neuropathy, retinopathy, and uh, nephropathy, they are four exist. So this should be one of the clinical uh, uh, measure, of clinical uh, to, to sending for retinal examination. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation. I'm a nephrologist, and um, uh, from my perspective, I'll just ask a short question. Uh, is there any correlation study with the level of urine ACR, with the level uh, uh, collaborating with the stages of diabetic retinopathy? Is there any surrogate marker which can be used? Uh, staging this because we as a physician we cannot understand what stage the urine and the retinopathy is there. So, is there any study which supports that? On con on the reverse side, is there any study which shows that use of ACRP or SGLT2 inhibitor reduces the stages or retards the stages of diabetic retinopathy? Uh, uh, no, there is no direct correlation between the ACRP level and the you know the staging system. These are the two different organs. They have started correlating between these two, but these are the two different organs which is getting affected. So the ultimate conclusion was there. The ACR is, as you know, it is purely reflects the renal status. And I is a, uh, it, it, there is a correlation, but these cannot go hand in hand. 
So if the patient who is having a more of a uh, hypertensive changes, they are more prone to develop the kidney changes first rather than the eye changes. So these are the, there are very gross correlation, but this this parameter of ACI parameter cannot be the uh, criteria for deciding whether if your ratio, ACR is very high or above this level. So this patient will go into moderate uh, non-qualifying diabetic ketosis. No, that is not. My question is whether there is any because both is microangiopathy. Yes. Both is hypertensive. Both is diabetic. So the same uh, vessels we are also having in kidney. Yes. So you are having the same endothelial damage there or, and as well as here. So the formula is here, they are leaking urine protein and there they are having leaking blood. So possibly this may be a, a insight which we can think. Till now whatever the literature is here, uh, it shows that there is no correlation because these are the two organ, how the organ is getting affected on that basis the rating system is there. I mean to put it grossly. So maybe in future even with the other biomarkers, we can look. Because possibly for us to look, think about diabetic nephropathy, we first think about diabetic nephropathy. Yeah. <laughs> so that is for us. So even, even yeah. for us also, the vice versa. Once we see those things, we always look. I have a small comment to make. Yes, but there are certain differences. Uh, I think we will wait at lunch, we will discuss after some money, we will we'll just come there. This was the last session before lunch. Let's join the Hall A for the most abundant lamp lighting session.